Well, are you ready, Jeremy? I think we're uh, we're at that time. All right. How many people? Yeah, we're filling up here. So we might have more people join us, but that's okay. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started at 12.01 here. So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Pam Schwartz. I'm the Chief Curator at the Orange County Regional History Center. And um, thank you all so much for, for joining us. We're really looking forward to uh, this sort of new frontier for us. Uh, this is our first fully virtual exhibition uh, in this way and our first, I guess, virtual curators tour then. Um, Jeremy, would you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jeremy Heilman. I am the One Orlando Registrar at the Orange County Regional History Center. Great. So uh, I want to go over a little bit of uh, webinar uh, 101 or etiquette, if you will. Uh, some of you may have done this before and some have not. Uh, what we have right now is we have everybody on mute and that's just to help cut down on the background noise. Um, Jeremy and I will sort of be trading off throughout the presentation uh, and we'll have sort of the screen share and things going on as well, uh, but hopefully you can also see us. Uh, I'll apologize in advance because I have two dogs that are very rowdy and sometimes the mailman comes and it causes all sorts of problems. Uh, so I just want to apologize, but I will try to mute myself if that happens. Uh, if I just sort of randomly drop out, I'll expect Jeremy to pick up my pieces. Um, I'm on it. <laughs> but <laughs> he's, he's used to it by now. Lots of Zoom meetings uh, with my crazy dogs. Um, but um, so if you have uh, questions or comments, uh, we really welcome those. We'd love to have them. Uh, we will probably hold some questions to the end just to kind of keep it easier going through, but some we might bring up in the middle. Uh, regardless, we don't want you to forget them. So please go ahead and just post those to us. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, you'll notice that uh, you either have a button that's called chat or there's might be like three dots that say more and a button that says chat. Um, that's just a general chat. So you can leave a comment there. You can ask a question, whatever you like. Uh, and we'll all sort of be monitoring that as we go. There's also the actual Q&A button uh, and the Q&A button, uh, the way that works is you can click it and you can type your question or uh, you can see if somebody else has already typed the same question you have and you can so, sort of click to, to one up that like I also have that. Uh, but we will try to keep an eye on both of those functions um, and make sure we get to all of those questions uh, within the time. So we're gonna do about an hour today. Uh, and if you, know, you have to jump off at any point, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty easy to do, but uh, we will try to, to go through and get all those questions answered if you have them, okay? Um, so first, I would like to go ahead and just provide a little bit of background. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with the History Center. Uh, if you've been to our location, uh, been to one of our Pulse exhibitions before, uh, or if you've actually spent some time looking at the site or not. So uh, we, as the History Center, cover uh, 12 to 14,000 years of history around a, a seven county region. So we're Orange County and all of the counties that touch it. And so we interpret a lot of, of stories and we, we collect a lot of history. Uh, in 2016, when the Pulse nightclub shooting happened, that's four years ago today, uh, as you all are probably aware, our museum um, decided to become the repository of the sort of material memory of the event and we began collecting. Uh, if you're local, you've probably seen us at the sites out collecting. Well, now four years later, we still do something Pulse related nearly every day. Uh, whether that's um, Jeremy bringing in some new artifacts, cataloging, ca excuse me, cataloging those that we collected even years ago, um, and things like that. So um, it's, it's still very much with us. It's very much with our community. Uh, and each year we have done an annual remembrance exhibition and they varied in size, they varied in topic. Uh, we've tried to make sure that uh, what we do, we feel reflects where our community is at in its healing and mourning process uh, and to try to make it interesting. Um, the collection now has, uh, we know over 10,000 objects. We're still growing the collection and still processing the collection. So that's not you know, an end number, but we have photographs, uh, 3D artifacts, we have hundreds of oral histories with survivors, families, first responders, community members, uh, and other individuals who are impacted. So uh, it is a growing living collection. Uh, the story is still unfolding, as you know, um, but each year for the remembrance, uh, this year included, we come up with a, a way 
we want to display something new and to provide you um, a different experience. And this year, um, I'll let Jeremy talk a little bit about some of our ideas and thoughts behind um, not only how we were planning the physical exhibition, uh, but of course the necessity around why we had to go to a virtual exhibition and what that meant for us. So, so yeah, uh, each year the History Center has done uh, an exhibit around this time uh, in remembrance of Pulse, just like Pam said, and the past couple of years, um, you know, moving as time kind of moves forward, the idea to kind of focus on some more specific things um, in order to make it different for visitors each year and also to showcase uh, a different set of items. Um, there was, you know, some discussion back and forth as to what uh, this year's topic would be. And the thing that was settled on was stories. And I know that sounds like kind of a broad, um, a broad topic, but Specifically, the idea was to um, sort of showcase items in the collection in a way that maybe wouldn't normally be um, featured in an exhibit where instead of uh, kind of telling a broader story and using artifacts to um, sort of exemplify that story, we kind of went in the other direction where we chose the artifacts and then um, sort of told the very specific stories that go along with those artifacts with the idea being that that would paint, um, you know, the greater picture of the community response to the Pulse nightclub shooting. And I think with, uh, you know, any kind of storytelling element, it's sometimes you would, I guess the natural inclination would be to tell a very broad story um, so that more people can, you know, the, the largest amount of people can relate to it. But I think by doing it this way and telling these like hyper specific stories, um, you know, although these actual experiences and these actual artifacts may relate to one person's life, I think it kind of gives you the opportunity to see some more intimate details of an individual's experience and kind of allow for, um, you know, people to connect to that in whatever way they do, um, which has sort of been kind of the one of the running themes with doing these exhibits is that people kind of connect to this in very unexpected ways. Um, so kind of the idea was to select some items and go through and um, you know talk about the history of the item and maybe the, if we are aware the individual who um, who owned or donated that item so um, as far as the idea to bring it online as we know um, a lot of things have been different lately uh, the museum actually closed uh, for a period uh, in the middle of March we have since reopened but um, during the sort of planning process for all of this, um, we reached a point where the content was pretty much solidified. Um, so kind of how this has, has worked at least the past couple of years where I've been involved was um, sort of towards the end of the prior year, we really kind of um, make solid plans as to what the exhibit's going to be, what the content is going to be. And then early on in the, the next year, we sort of start the writing process, the, you know, all the work that goes into all that. So by mid-March, we were kind of at that point already, um, but the decision to um, go online, we had kind of held off on, and Pam, as the chief curator, kind of was faced with that decision um, with the idea that even if us as um, the staff at the History Center was able to kind of get in there and start working on this, would we be open to the public at that point to be able to see it? So uh, there was a lot of unknown uh, with the, um, with, you know, the pandemic situation, everything. So it was decided to take this online. Um, of course, we would have loved to have had like a physical exhibit the way that we normally have done in the past. But I think, um, you know, this gives us an opportunity to do things a little bit differently. And Although, you know, there were some challenges with getting everything prepared and online, I think it gives people a chance who otherwise you know, would not be able to visit the museum for whatever reason, um, an opportunity to kind of see and have access to the items in our collection. So um, I hope everyone can see the screen here that I'm sharing um, of the actual exhibit. I'm making this, this bird move, which was a nice little feature that Pam added in there. Um, so the exhibit is called The Stories They Could Tell. And um, this is a, uh, a page on the historycenter.org. And um, as Pam said, feel free to ask questions kind of throughout. I know that'll kind of um, help us see what you may be interested in. 
one thing with this to kind of keep in mind is that this will be up. Um, so if you have not had a chance yet to check this out, um, you can kind of go back and read through whatever um, particular things interest you. I'm not going to, you know, read the entire uh, exhibit to you during this. Uh, the idea is to kind of, uh, you know, explain why some of the choices were made and what was done to kind of get us to the point that we're at. So one thing right off the bat that I want to point out is that this uh, entire exhibit is available in both English and Spanish. We are doing this presentation today in English, um, but next week, next Friday on June 19th, we will, uh, there will be a Spanish language version where uh, there will be a guided tour of the exhibit done in Spanish. So, um, so I'm going to click into the English version here. Okay, we're moving through here. Load might up. take a yeah, might take sorry a, about a, that. Like it's a load. There Thanks we go. Yep. <laughs> Maybe a little extra traffic. Um, so, like I said, the idea was uh, to kind of tell these stories. So, um, the selection of the items, uh, we have a lot of items in the collection um, that we have knowledge on um, a very interesting story um, surrounding it. And then there are some items that we don't necessarily know. Um, much about and we're able to kind of research and find out more about. Um, so kind of there's a good mixture of those kind of things. And the idea of telling the story, um, kind of the, the, one of the, the things that have been a common element throughout all these exhibits is that um, as much as we want to tell different um, kind of sides of things in terms of the different stories involved, we also want to honor um, the 49 victims the best way that we can. And I think uh, sort of tying that in with the idea of telling stories, um, you know, the idea that the end of a life doesn't necessarily mean the end of a story and that, um, you know, we can continue to keep their memory alive and continue to tell the story and hopefully, um, you know, gain perspective as time goes on, the sort of effects and the community response to this, this tragedy. So, um, kind of appropriate for today, um, the first item that you'll see in the exhibit is the proclamation for Orlando United Day, which just happens to be today. Um, you'll see here that um, kind of the way that this is set up is um, there's a description of the item and then um, the actual item itself and then a timeline that kind of describes the life of the item. So. Um, the idea that we would be able to kind of tell you um, how, you know, this specific item came about and how it kind of came into the collection. So, um, like I said, kind of a, an appropriate, um, appropriate artifact for today. And now you'll notice um, the, uh, the EKG, the rainbow colored EKG line behind um, the timeline here. The idea when uh, we first started um, kind of working this out was that you would walk into the gallery and this EKG line would kind of surround the whole area and that would be the sort of common timeline element that no matter uh, how many sort of dates were featured in the given timeline that uh, each one would feature June 12, 2016 as kind of a connecting point, which is both um, literal and symbolic of how all these uh, seemingly you know, unrelated items kind of connect on that specific day. So um, that was kind of one of the challenges. And I know that Pam, as the one who sort of built out the majority of this website from a, um, you know, a web perspective, uh, there was a lot of challenge in figuring out the best way um, to do this. And it was decided kind of early on that uh, it was important that the, there was sort of a a horizontal scroll feature that would allow this EKG concept to still come to life, albeit in a different form. Um, you know, and again, maybe it would look a little bit differently on a wall, but I think that it definitely sort of conveys what we were going for here. Um, but there is, you know, some technical challenge to that, as Pam can attest to, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd add. Um... I think that was like one of the hardest parts about considering making this a virtual exhibition because so much of, of history relies on a sense of place, uh, a sense of being next to the real thing, right? This isn't just any car, it's the car. This isn't just any hat, it's the hat. 
Um, and, you know, imagine if you've been to one of our exhibitions, imagine walking into the space and just seeing this rainbow EKG line connecting all of these objects throughout the entire room. And we're talking floor to ceiling. We're not, we're not saying that this is sort of a small motif. This was really going to run through a majority of the exhibition. And uh, it was sort of, um, it was difficult to just say, well, how are we going to do this online? Because online is given to being, um, you know, very, very vertical and not very horizontal. And, um, you know, our website is set up to be for our museum. It's not a digital storytelling site. We're not the New York Times. Um, so trying to figure out how to, how to build it. We also don't have an actual, um, I, we have a, a web designer who helps us with our web page, but we don't have like an in-house uh, individual who, um, who assists, assists in building a website like this. So we just sort of figured it out on our own. Um, but I think uh, the way we had decided to lay this out, I, I hope <laughs> is conveyed um, successfully here because the biggest point was that this connecting line of June 12th, as Jeremy said, it connects all of these items at one point in the story of the the object. We're used to hearing stories about people or stories about objects, but uh, we really wanted to take and look at each one of these artifacts um, before Pulse touched it or after in the life that it's lived. And so, so pointing those out. So, so yeah, um, I want to point out this children's book. Where do they go? Is an example of one of the items that had been in our collection, and we were able to do some research and find out a little bit more about it. Um, the book was actually written by the author Julia Alvarez, who um, is a, a pretty well-known uh, writer who has won the uh, Hispanic Heritage Foundation Award in Literature and also the National Medal of Arts, which is a very, very high honor, and um, she is a very well-respected author. And the story of this book was that um, she was coming to Orlando to speak at a children's literature uh, conference prior to the publication of Where Do They Go? And um, this was in June of 2016, soon after the shooting. So she changed her speech to address um, a lot of the um, kind of the feeling of the moment and address the victims and kind of discuss that. And the following day decided to take an advanced copy of this book down to the, um, the hospital, the Orlando Regional Medical Center and signed it and left it there at the memorial. So um, we have this in the collection and we're able to connect with her and um, spoke with her a couple times. And I know that Pam did a more formal oral history um, regarding this book and her decision to leave it. So kind of one of those stories where um, it seems like an interesting item and then the more um, you kind of dig into it, you find that the story is a little bit deeper than maybe you had originally even thought. And for the people who leave the items, um, the idea that the, you know, the book would end up in a museum um, as opposed to um, you know whatever, I don't think, and Julia had actually said that herself that, you know. I don't think a lot of people imagine necessarily where these memorial items are going to end up. So I think uh, our sort of preservation of those items allow those memorials to kind of live on. Um, I think that people who, you know, were not able to visit or not ready to visit, I think uh, sort of keeping these around and uh, allowing people to have the opportunity to see them at a later time, in this case, four years after the fact, I think that um, that sort of is one of the big functions of the uh, the one Orlando collection. So, um, and like I said, I'm not gonna go through every uh, every moment of this timeline here, but I'll just kind of go through um, the items. So um, one thing also, just in terms of like the, uh, the actual physical makeup of the exhibit, um, one thing is that, so this uh, photograph of Christina Grimmie is a is a physical printed photograph and i know that with some of the um the non-dimensional items it might not uh appear that way on uh, on the website but this is a, a printed photo and you can kind of see some of the the wrinkles there that it was printed on like a you know like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper um so this is christina grimmy uh who uh unfortunately was killed the night prior to pulse uh at the plaza theater um, in downtown Orlando or just outside of downtown Orlando. And um, because that happened so closely to Pulse, I think the association between the two events 
um, was certainly made. And there were people who left some items related to Christina at some of the Pulse um, memorial sites. And this photo, um, sadly, is actually from the performance that evening. So the person who printed this out um, got this photograph uh, either online or from their own, I'd imagine, online. But they, uh, this is actually kind of in the last couple hours of her life, which is very tragic. But um, we felt like, you know, because that story kind of tied together and because there was the connection to Pulse, that that would be a good thing to feature. Um, as you can see, we have the Orlando United shirt, which was um, kind of all over the place. And you still see quite a bit. That symbol has become pretty synonymous with Pulse and with the community response. Um, and Orlando City Soccer was actually the one who kind of came up with this fundraiser and uh, the design of the heart. And they were um, nice enough to speak to us and kind of tell us that story. How quickly this all came about was one of the things that I was definitely impressed with, um, how they were able to kind of within that week have the shirt out and available for purchase. I think that given how you know present it's been since then, I think that's a very, very interesting thing that they had that within within the week available for people to buy. So moving through some of these items here. This is another interesting uh, piece that we have that I think has been kind of a favorite among uh, the staff here. Uh, it, it's a sign that says BU um, and it has a handwritten note. Um, the sign was held by this little boy named Lucas, who um, his two fathers um, and himself were at the steps of the US Supreme Court um, when uh, <clears throat> the, um, the Oberfell versus Hodges case was settled, uh, allowing for same sex marriage. So um, we had this sign and did not have um, any knowledge other than the photo and the name Lucas. Um, so this is a case of, we felt it was so compelling that we were able to kind of write this story um, as it was. And in the process of doing that, I know that Pam was able to find a photograph of this family and we were able to kind of track down through um, kind of the help of the ACLU, uh, the chapter in Washington, D.C., where um, obviously the, this event took place, uh, we were able to find the name. So we are kind of in the process of hopefully contacting those individuals and getting a little bit more of their story. So that's another thing uh, where, you know, we're able to kind of, as we maybe get new information or seek out some more insights, we're able to um, update this website and um, kind of get some more information there. Yeah, I, I would add to that. So it's, it's an interesting case and it's not the only one of its kind for us. Um, we always invite any individuals to reach out to us and say, I left this item, do you have it? Sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes it is unfortunately no, but um, do you have it? And we say, yes, you know, here's a, here's a photo or here's the item. Would you be willing to tell us more about its story? Um, and we always ask people only to share what they're comfortable with sharing. Some of these things are very personal to people, uh, but you can see uh, the way that these stories can be interpreted and how much they mean to people and how interesting they are. Uh, this was like Jeremy said, a staff favorite because it's this little boy and he talks about the, the moment he was able to be recognized as a whole family and he chose to leave that moment at Pulse for the people. Um, and so like, how cool, like how amazing is this, this little boy, Lucas? And all we knew was Lucas in this photo and Lucas isn't from here. Um, it's, a, it's amazing and scary what you can do with the internet. And like, I know one of my staff tracked down a little sketch of Mickey holding a pride flag by initials that were on it from the artist. Uh, and she was able to figure out who made it and we were able to talk to them. In this case, I did a reverse Google image search for this picture, which was just like a, a picture of a picture, right? Um, and the name Lucas ACLU and looked through, I don't know how many Google results, but ended up finding a picture that was on the newspaper from that day of a whole line of people holding these ACLU flags. Uh, and there was Lucas with his fathers. And I was like, 
is that him? And I looked and I looked and I looked and I found a different view and I sent him to Jeremy and I'm like, Jeremy, this is him, right? This is Lucas and his dad's. And, um, so yeah, so then the, the sleuthing continued and I was like, you know, they're, they're wearing like ACLU shirts. They have flags. Maybe somebody knows them. I said, it, it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, just a, just a try or grasping at the stars here, but, um, you know, they're not from this state. They're not from Washington DC where they were when these things were made. They live, they live someplace else and now they live somewhere else. And, uh, it is, we like to call it thoughtful investigation as opposed to like stalking. <laughs> right. But it's, um, it is amazing what you can do with the internet. And so, yeah, so Jeremy is, has found them and we're, hopefully we'll talk to them. And if they, you know, if anybody ever says, you know, we left it and we don't, we don't want to discuss it where, you know, whatever, that's totally fine, but it can be so meaningful and magical and impactful to hear the stories. Um, in the case of Julia with her book, you know, just, she's, not only an eloquent writer, but everything, every word that comes out of her mouth is beautiful. And so doing this oral history and the story and the, and the feelings she gave, it just, it really helped me to understand how very personal this item was to her and that she chose to leave it for the 49 and for our community uh, is really touching. And I'm sure for a boy like Lucas to have shared this really special moment to him. Um, so we hope, we hope that he'll, he'll share his story too. Um, but I just wanted to, to add that it, if, if stories don't come to us, we seek the stories. Uh, it happens a lot of different ways. Yeah, and I also think um, as great as it is that we were kind of able to find out who these people were, um, you know, unfortunately, there are going to be some items with just the sheer number of things in the collection that we're not going to find the stories about. And um, I don't think that that Although we would love to, I, I think that that doesn't necessarily make those items any less interesting. And I think that sometimes the not knowing those stories, um, you know, you can still glean a lot of significance off of whatever that simple item may be. So um, I think it's good that this item is sort of an example of both of those things. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of update the story as we go along here. But, um, but yeah, so continuing on. And like I said, if anyone has any um, specific questions about any of these items, feel free to ask. Um, we are somewhat limited by time here, so I don't wanna, wanna go through every single thing. This is another item um, that I think is, is of, of great interest. I, um, I think it's very similar to the, the BU sign, Lucas's sign, in that it's an extremely personal item that was left at the Pulse Memorial site. Uh, in this case, we were able to actually speak with the person who had left the flag. Um, her name is Terry Sopp, and her mother um, was a nurse in the Navy Corps um, during the 1950s. And as this note that is attached to the flag, this is a very large flag. I think this is nine feet, nine feet wide. Yeah. So. This is another limit of an online exhibition versus the in person because imagine walking up to this nine foot like it takes up a whole wall like we yeah it would have like, taken up a whole wall and yeah we it. reserved a whole section of the exhibit for just this flag because it's it's amazing and it's you know it's it's magnificent in its size um, so you don't really get that across here unfortunately but that's why yeah. you get the insiders tour <laughs> exactly so this flag was something that. Um, was given to Terry um, when her mother passed away in 1978. Um, so as the only child, she uh, held on to this flag for you know, her whole life up until this point and would uh, put it on display in front of her house um, for um, like 4th of July and sort of patriotic situations. Um, but when Pulse happened, Terry actually lived down the street from the nightclub and um, she sort of quickly made the connection between her mother's life and um, what had happened there in that um, her mother was always kind of looking out for other people, um, both as a nurse and as someone who was a champion of civil rights and um, you know, the, the rights and the fair treatment of all people and all Americans um, sort of you know, symbolic with that flag. So um, with this, uh, this all happening in June, uh, Terry, when it came time to hang the flag up on the 4th of July in 2016, she decided that instead of putting it up in her, um, at her home, she would take it down to the nightclub and put it up 
um, at the memorial site for the victims and for people to see. And um, I was really struck by that just because I feel like, um, you know, everyone has sort of different perspectives on things, but I think the idea that a very personal item like that, that was, um, you know, for your mother and something that you held on to since, you know, the late seventies, uh, would be a difficult item to kind of just lose possession of and give up. And I think that, um, you know, it speaks to Terry's unselfishness, but it also speaks to her mother's unselfishness in that, um, you know, when we got a hold of Terry and were, was able to ask her about this, um, she kind of was almost like, I, you know, she was of the opinion that it was almost silly for her to hang on to it, that um, it would serve a greater purpose um, as part of that memorial and would let people um, know how she felt about it and how her mother felt about it after this, this terrible act of violence, um, how you know, her mother would be so appalled with this and that, um, you know, her mother was deeply concerned with, with all people and all the people that she had walked uh, alongside in her time in the military. And um, I think that this is sort of, in a way, encapsulates a lot of what this exhibit is about because it allows her to keep the memory of her mother alive. It allows her to connect to um, the people feeling lost as part of um, the Pulse shooting. And I think that the story of the flag prior to Pulse and then what was done with it after all kind of, it paints a, a very interesting picture of people's response to this. And I think is one of the, you know, the more positive examples of how you can connect, you know, so many people connect to the story in such, you know, interesting and sometimes unexpected ways, so. So yeah, like like Pam had said, this is uh, this would have been a very significant feature of the exhibit. Um, very large flag. I don't know if it's even possible to get that scale from here, but but yeah, that's definitely one of the the interesting items in the in the exhibit here. This is another personal item. I think Pam would be able to speak on this a little bit better than I. Um, she, we had both spoken to the person that this belonged to, uh, artist Michael Pilato. Um, and this uh, statue is something that he had given to his daughter um, that she kept throughout her life, uh, along with other mementos that she had received from her father and unfortunately passed away. Um, Pam, you, you're, you, uh, yeah have a relationship with Michael you've worked yeah. with him previously. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we have these timelines on here and we've worked on this for months. And as Jeremy's scrolling through, I'm like, you know, we should have included that other moment in time. There's more moments in time. Uh, we're sort of relegated to what text we can fit on your screen. <laughs> um, of course, curators are happy to talk to anybody endlessly and to put more and more text on the walls, but we try to be reasonable. Um, I was just thinking about things that could be added to the the beautiful, uh, amazing hand signed uh, flag. But um, many of you might be familiar with Michael Pilato, maybe not by name, uh, but by his work. Uh, if anybody has seen the large inspiration Orlando mural, I think it's it was on Burton's for a while. It's been showed uh, shown like at Lake Eola or at the Pulse site. It's the huge one that's sort of a collage of lots of of different people. Um, but Michael Pilato and Yuri Karabash uh, are the ones who, who painted that and have worked on that project. And this little statue is about this big. It's just like, I don't know. Yeah, that's another side. thing that your, your sense of scale is a little bit off on, yeah. on an online situation like this. But it's just the happiest little, little statue. And, and, you know, the story is, is, you know, kind of, I guess, personal because I, I met Michael working on the mural and he was meeting all of these people and just very interesting people. Um, and I said, you know, you, you've met everyone and you've moved here and you've made this mural and how does it connect with your life and would you do an oral history? Uh, so at the one year exhibition, he came to do an oral history and I said, you know, where do you want to do it? You know, we could just like go sit in the exhibit um, because we work with a, an artist, Thomas Thorsbeck, and who paints our oral histories. There's always a, a watercolor portrait. So we sat in the exhibition, but I gave him a little mini tour, just like we're doing with you. Um, we gave him a mini tour and he just beeline for this case and he goes that's 
that's, that's mine. I left that. I left that at the memorial. So of tens of thousands of things we've collected, of the maybe three or 400 items we put in the first display, um, we chose this tiny little, little um, statuette or figurine, if you will. Uh, and so I said, well, you're gonna have to tell us about that story. And so we learned about it um, and it's a, it's a beautiful story. It's very sad and heart touching. Um, but it's just, again, like Jeremy said, it's, it's amazing the unexpected ways people's, the threads in their lives weave together. Uh, and the fact that he had been through the exhibit and hadn't even noticed it, but then walking through, he just spotted it and went straight for it um, because it's this tiny two inches uh, in piles and cases of things, uh, piles at the memorials cases and the exhibition of, of items. So um, very, very personal to him. And this is sort of a, another, avenue of his story um, aside from that of that that large beautiful mo uh, memorial mural that they have made. So um, at this point I'd kind of like to continue on to another element of the exhibit um, just to kind of continue forward again feel free to sort of peruse this at your um, at your leisure in the future this will be up. So um, one of the um, kind of going back to the idea of items that we don't know the story about. Um, there have been several efforts with certain items to kind of find out more about either through um, pursuing, uh, you know, a name on the item or um, posting them online. And these are an example of some of these. Um, and like Pam had mentioned, there are over 10,000 items uh, related to the Pulse nightclub shooting in the one Orlando collection um, that were um, collected at memorial sites or later donated or, um, you know, from whatever uh, source there. But these are some of um, the kind of interesting items that we have that we do not know the story about. So um, we are always welcoming people who may have, um, you know, left these items or may have a lead on who left these items that may want to share their story to contact us. Um, you can do that through um, this this online exhibition, you can contact the One Orlando Collection here. The email address is right here, and you can also check out um, the larger One Orlando uh, Collection Digital Memorial, which is um, kind of the front-facing version of our online catalog for the One Orlando Collection, which I will show you here in a bit. But these are a few items that um, that are, you know, items that we do not know who left or um, their story or what compelled them to do that. Um, here at the bottom on the right, there is a green origami bird, which was the inspiration for the logo design for this, this exhibition. So um, kind of that's a little, little tidbit there for you. Uh, this is something that I think uh, people have really connected with. Um, another thing that may have been a little bit more dramatic in person, but I think it, it comes across well here as well. Um, the idea of having an empty exhibition case and the concept being that um, although the collection is large, there are so many items that just could not be kept for whatever reason. Um, just the sheer numbers or the items were ruined by the weather or um, even you know things that people had intended to share and did not or it just represents all the things that um, even though we have so many of these great stories, there's a lot of stories that will unfortunately go untold or will take, you know, quite a bit more time for them to kind of come to light. So we want to um, kind of showcase that as a way of saying that those items are still important. And um, just because, you know, they're not a part of the collection, that, that doesn't mean that the sentiment behind them or means any less. So yeah and you know to to Ill further illustrate that you know you walk into an imagine the physical space you walk in you see this ekg these items all this text this information and then you turn around and they're like this this case is four foot by four foot so stretch your arms out and think about that four foot by four foot case and it was just going to be empty and you don't expect, I think, I mean, at least we didn't think you would expect to see it of just a stark empty case in the middle of, a, of an exhibit. Um, and that would make you really, I think, stop and think like, oh, what's supposed to be in here? 
well, what is supposed to be in there? And it's, it's both sort of literal, like these are literally the things we did not collect, but it's symbolic, but it's also symbolic of just the stories around Pulse in general that we'll never, we'll never know. Um, it's the stories of the, the 49 who were, were taken and the stories that should have unfolded, but have not. Um, well, they're, they're just changing. That's a different legacy now, right? The stories yeah. are, are still, are still going on. So I guess those are stories that are being told. They're just different than they would have been. Um, but it's, yeah, it's items, it's, it's stories people haven't shared about their own lives, their own personal tragedies, their own connections to this event. Um, it just sort of goes on and on, but you know, we talked about how do you convey this sort of a, like the presence of absence um, or the absence of presence, I guess you can put it either way, but like, how do you convey that in a virtual exhibit? Is it just like a black screen? Uh, and I was like, you know, I guess let's just put the empty case there. It doesn't quite come across the same, um, but it's one of those things that it's just, it's a different experience when you're in a physical space than when you're in a virtual space uh, and trying to convey um, the feelings that just this stark empty emptiness of, of not having those stories. So it was definitely um, a challenge and we ended up just not, not changing our minds on it, I guess. Yeah, so another um, kind of element that I think people have shown some interest in is the history of the actual building um, that the nightclub was housed in. And I think that um, it's sort of a, a different take on this in that, um, you know, the the club itself is kind of the largest artifact related to um to pulse so the idea that the building had existed for quite some time prior to this and that um you know as as the timeline goes and as stories are told uh there are people who have other memories of this building and um you know some of them happy some of them not but uh the idea that we, the people who had come here previous to Pulse, the people who came to Pulse, that there is some kind of interconnectivity between all of that and that, um, you know, showing the building as an artifact itself. So the first uh, record of a business at this property is um, the Dixie Village Motors, which was a uh, car dealership. So that's an example of one of uh, the cars that would have been available there in the late 60s. Um, it was also Sun Aluminum. Uh, they were a company that made like pool enclosures and different kind of um, buildings using aluminum. And one of the kind of interesting ones that I don't think is out there too much is that um, it was home to a restaurant called the Yum Yum Hut, um, which was uh, um, a local entrepreneur who had started a business selling sauce and decided to open a restaurant um, that showcased that product. So. Um, kind of the first foray into, um, you know, like a seated restaurant type situation, which led to um, Papa Angelo's and then eventually the uh, kind of the most well-known thing that Pulse was prior to becoming the nightclub was Lorenzo's Pizzeria. Um, it was there for over 20 years. So there are a lot of people in town who still remember that um, people from that neighborhood or people who had worked at the Orlando Health Campus who um, kind of frequented that restaurant. So that's something that um, I learned about uh, in working with these items. There were uh, you know, things where people would leave comments about how they remember going to Lorenzo's and how tragic um, everything ended up being with how that, that building ended up. So, um, and then just before Pulse, uh, the restaurant kind of became a, it was still a restaurant, but it also became a little bit more like a nightclub where um, musical acts started to play. And um, that was sort of its foray into the, the nightlife world. So we have an example of one of the concert posters of an act that had played there. Um, so like I said, this is just another kind of element of the story that maybe hasn't been told as much and that we were interested in and wanted to, to convey. Um, of course, in 2004, the building became Pulse Nightclub, um, and following the shooting is now, um, as it is today, is uh, the interim memorial at the site with all the um, the tribute items and the the decor there, kind of expressing the the tragedy. Um, and of course, you know, as time moves forward, we'll, there'll be 
a more permanent memorial there at that property, which will be, you know, kind of the long lasting legacy of what that building became. But we wanted to share that just because um, that item, you know, being a physical sort of artifact, the building is not something you might necessarily think about all the time, but um, it does connect to a lot of people in a lot of ways. And we wanted to make sure that we sort of shared that story. And something to add to that too, is that of course, we know the, the existence of that property before 1967, but sort of as Jeremy was delving into that, um, it, property changes, right? The, the boundaries change, the zoning changes, the communities change. So, you know, before that, it would have, the whole uh, South Downtown area was farm fields. It was uh, citrus groves, right? So maybe not directly before that, but in terms of you know, looking in city directories and other or other types of uh, research materials from our research library uh, in the History Center. Um, this is what we were sort of be able to find and illustrate, but it's a it's an ongoing project to sort of, you know, look at the longer legacy. But um, Jeremy had had this idea and I thought it was really interesting to show the building and it's in its separate timeline, but it's almost exactly the same as all the objects we were showing you before. It, the site is an artifact that has lived this life of all these different ways and it shares that same June 12th uh, line and then it's got it's got a life after that and so um, I mean it seems it seems obvious that these things change over time but it's always interesting to see how they touch people and when they touch them uh, one of the stories I had told Jeremy was I literally went to look at my first house to buy I lived in Orlando only four months before Pulse happened and I was going to go look at houses to buy and I was gonna go out and meet my realtor. And he used to go to Pulse all the time. And so he was telling me these stories about it. And of course, my brain is just like trying to absorb it all uh, as a historian and, and thinking about what we were gonna do. And then I called my landlord later in the day and he goes, you know, I can't really talk about this. Like this is, it's just such a crazy day. And he goes, I used to eat at Lorenzo's all the time. And that just really stuck with me because we're talking about Pulse and what happened. And like, all he could think about was how much time, you know, he'd also spent in that building and how familiar it was to him and that it was Lorenzo's and that was, he connected to it as Lorenzo's. He, he mentioned his kids also went to Paul's, um, but it was just, it's just interesting as Jeremy's bringing up this idea is it's like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, I've heard people talk about it being Lorenzo's. I've heard, or I've heard all this. I, it wasn't that, you know, since I've been here, it's always been Paul's. Um, but it's interesting how people, all the different avenues people find to connect with, with objects and with places. Yeah, so um, the next sort of element we have in the exhibit, um, which is another thing that was significantly changed uh, with going online, but again, is an opportunity maybe um, for some people to participate that otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, we try to have some kind of interactive element with, uh, with each exhibit, and the idea for um, the stories they could tell would be to invite people to tell their own story. So to talk about um, an item that they own or did own that would uh, sort of exemplify a story of their life and invite people to think about things in a way um, that maybe they wouldn't normally and sort of uh, be able to tell their story through an object, which is what we were trying to do with the exhibit. So um, there are some examples of uh, some people who have shared their, their items, some very interesting and touching stories here. Um, and you are able to participate in this if you would like. Um, you can click the share your story here and you'll be able to submit a photograph and um, some text regarding uh, the item that you choose. So we would invite you to do that. Um, it's definitely encouraged. And I think, um, you know, I think this process allows people to sort of um, gain different perspectives on things that are important to them and how, um, you know, a material item can kind of exemplify that in their life and for you know the people around them so um please if you're interested or have something that you think would be um be good to share go ahead and share your story with us and that could be pulse or not pulse related absolutely you'll see, yeah you'll see one of the items i think here is is pulse related and the others aren't but um it's it's really just more about thinking about things that are special to you um and what their life has been because we all come to have an object at a certain point and it had a life before us uh, and has a change of life with us. So we, we think it's really interesting to hear it's, you know, we kind of, in a way, it's part of the provenance, uh, that's sort of our museum terminology for like the life of an object and how it got to be where it is today. 
So we come to the portion um, that represents the individuals, um, the 49 individuals who lost their lives at the Pulse nightclub shooting. Now, um, this is something that it's very important to us that we, uh, we have representation each year in some way of all the individuals because, um, you know, as much as there's a lot that goes into the story, this is kind of the, the main focus of um, what we hope to remember about this and can make sure that these um, these stories continue on. So um, there are photos of all the 49 individuals and I think, um, right, and I know that Pam can speak on this um, as part of her sort of planning for the One Orlando connect, uh, collection initially is that, um, you know, we wanna show these individuals and we wanna show them with the people that they, um, we're friends with or in relationships with at that club um, with the idea that, um, you know, we show them in, in this form the same way that they live and that um, we want, you know, everyone to be remembered in that way. So um, with the, uh, the online exhibit, uh, we sort of utilized um, the items in the One Orlando collection. So you can, um, each individual, you can click and see their name and then it connects out to um, the One Orlando Collection website where you can scroll through and see items that pertain to that individual. So each of the 49 individuals have um, cataloged items and photographs that you'll be able to look and learn more about. Um, so for example, um, Akira Murray here, if you'd like to learn more about this sign or you know any of the other items there, you'd be able to do that. Um, so this website um, has been up for a while, but um, as part of this exhibit, we were able to add almost 700 new items um, into, into this database here that you'll be able to check out and see. And um, I think the initial concept for the physical exhibit was to, um, have a touch screen where you'd be able to come up and take a look and select by individual and kind of see these items as you as you went through. But um, in lieu of that, we've kind of done the same thing on an online platform. So um, I think it's you know important. Obviously, this is you know as I mentioned before, um, it's important that their stories continue on and that um, as much as what we do with the One Orlando Collection is to preserve the history of this. Um, you know, historical moment in our community. Also, it serves as a, you know, a memorial to all of these individuals here. So um, I think it's uh, definitely worth your time to kind of look through some of these and kind of learn a little bit more about the individuals, um, you know, that it's not just the name or a photo on a screen, that all these are our lives lived and that, um, you know, that had hopes and interests and dreams for the future. So I think the more that we take the time to learn about the people and know them as people. I think that sort of um, serves to the, the purpose of this exhibit to where, um, you know, all these stories connect, all these stories are important. And um, that's kind of what we wanted to do here. So. That's, um, you know, sort of the inside on some of our curatorial decision making. Uh, every exhibition that we do, we have to decide a title. Titles are hard. Every exhibit, uh, should this be placed to the, next to this, or can that go by that? Are those colors going to clash? Are the stories going to flow? Um, it's a lot of decision making, and with with it's it's something we discuss all of the time. But especially at the first year, and trying to figure out like how do we properly as best we can remember the forty nine, and with that, we made a lot of decisions that we stuck by. Uh, that's not to say we ha don't change uh, when it makes sense, but we try not to put the individuals in alphabetical order. Uh, we try because we don't want you to read the first four names and then sort of trail off. And by, by constantly changing it, you're constantly seeing um, new, uh, new faces um, that maybe you didn't get far enough to. Um, we try to keep, as Jeremy said, our friends and relationship groups together. And of course, that also disrupts that ability to have alphabetical um, and we, you know, we try to move it around and we do really try to emphasize having photographs. It is easy to ignore a wall of text, especially one you felt you read before. Um, it is not as easy to sort of ignore or walk by 49 pairs of eyes uh, and 49 smiles and 49 uh, beautiful people um, staring back at you. And so we do encourage people to sort of read their names, 
read their stories uh, and look at the items that were left by their families and friends because it gives you a lot of insight into into those individuals and so that is something we sort of had to decide at the first year and we just sort of try to be really consistent in our treatment um, but that's not to say we don't change our minds uh, the more we learn about this event um, and the more that things change uh, and family requests and friend requests and things like that we try to take all of those um, different uh, facets of the story into account. Yeah, so um, kind of wrapping up our tour here, um, at the, the end of the page here, you'll be able to click and see um, the past couple years what um, the exhibits were like at uh, the 2018 and 2019 uh, remembrance points. So feel free to kind of take a look at those as well um, and kind of see how uh, you know, the sort of different theming and ideas uh, sort of came to life as we, uh, you know, have gone through this, this process. Um, so we can go ahead and answer any questions that may be. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to, to type those out in the chat box or in the Q&A. We do have one question um, from Peter. He said, uh, were there any items too large to store at the History Center? If so, what were they? Um, well, we're still collecting. Um, I think there's a few different answers to that. We have collected a lot of things. We've collected things that are eight foot by eight foot. We've collected the entire couch from Ikea. Uh, we've collected a, a baby grand piano that used to be inside of Pulse. Um, so we've collected a lot of large things. Luckily, you know, on site, if you've been to the History Center, you can probably assume we don't have much storage. We do have a separate collections storage facility uh, that is fully climate controlled where we keep this collection. And the collection for Pulse does take up a lot of space, but we're very fortunate we have about 14,000 foot of, um, not quite that because that's the whole building, but uh, in terms of space for storage. So we're pretty fortunate that way. Um, there is, uh, there are more items that are sort of earmarked um, that are even larger to come. Uh, sometimes we can take things apart and store them, sometimes we cannot. Uh, Jeremy had sort of alluded to the fact that the building really truly is the largest artifact, right? We're not going to pick that up and move it. And that's of course not the intention if you've paid attention, um, not the intention if you've paid attention to uh, the forthcoming plans for the permanent memorial and museum. Uh, the History Center did go inside of Pulse uh, after the FBI and biohazard were uh, done doing what they needed to do. Uh, we took out like a five by five foot of wall. We took out um, some different things that were pretty sizable, um, but you know, things we could, you know, fit or transport in a truck and then store. Um, the plans are not set yet, but if you, if you looked again at the designs, one of the things they've considered uh, is taking actually sort of a, a V-shaped um, slice out of the building to create a pathway. Um, and if, you, if you've not seen those designs, do please go look at them. They're on the, the One Pulse Foundation uh, website uh, from the Chosen Architects. But that's one of the items, it's like figuring out the logistics. Well, how do we remove that piece? How do we keep it intact? How does it get installed in the future permanent museum? Um, so sometimes artifacts are whole buildings. Uh, sometimes they are slices of buildings, um, but so far we've not, um, not for Pulse specifically, there are objects uh, unrelated to Pulse we've turned down because it's just heavy <laughs> or it's too large um, and we can't care for it or move it. Um, you know, having an artifact that we can store at offsite, but it'll cost us a several hundred dollar truck every time we need to move it or do something with it. Uh, is a little bit dynamic. So um, that's uh, hopefully that answers your question, but for, for Pulse, nothing too large yet. So I, I think also um, as it relates to this exhibit, I think there is some consideration as to um, the size of the items, like with the flag, um, you know, we couldn't necessarily have 10 flag size items or something like that. So, um, you know, it does range from that food eye statue that's probably two inches high to the, the nine feet long or nine foot long flag. So, um, but that is sort of one of the, the benefits of going online is that the size is not necessarily um, as big of an issue. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as we move forward that we may be able to showcase some items that otherwise we not have the ability to do. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Thank you for your comment, Peter. That's very kind. Uh, 
Peter said this was one of his favorite webinars so far. And uh, he appreciates our hard work and keeping the history and the memories alive. And I will say that, uh, you know, when False First happened, it was, it was our response. Um, while a lot of people were doing a lot of things, we thought preserving the memory was a, the role that we could fulfill for the community. And we've learned so much. Um, and we hope that what we've, what we've done, um, not only in preserving the collection for the future um, and for the individuals now, but in these exhibitions, um, providing education and inspiration to, to action um, and uh, a place for, you know, sort of healing and taking a moment. Um, and maybe, you know, one of the things we've talked about is that maybe sitting on your couch at home, uh, enjoying the virtual exhibit is, is just as peaceful um, of an experience as standing in the exhibition um, and reading it on the on the walls too. So definitely some some pros to the virtual. But um, let's see here, one last check. I don't think we have any more questions. So um, from my perspective, we are good on time. Um, and hold on, we've got one more thing. Oh, great. Um, so. I just want to thank everybody for attending. We hope you enjoyed this. This is very much, uh, you know, new for us as it is new for everybody during this this crazy time. But uh, we do hope that this really increases accessibility to the exhibition. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. We hope you share it. If you know anybody who's interested in this story um, but could not have attended, potentially because they are Spanish speaking only, keep in mind we do have um, the full Spanish uh, webinar that we'll be doing next Friday. Uh, and be available to, you know, answer questions there too. Um, and please provide feedback. Feel free to, to let us know what you like, what you think we could do better. Uh, this is a method that we have considered using more in the future. Um, not only can we meet, reach our local audience, but we can also provide the, this topic, this education, and this, this work uh, globally. So in the future, we'd love to be able to make our exhibits more uh, available and accessible and for longer. Uh, if you've been to an exhibit at the History Center, um, you know, they're usually three to four months and once they close, they're just sort of gone. So this might be an opportunity um, to sort of dip our toes into um, thinking in the future about how we can can make our exhibits and, and all the, the hard work and the love that goes into them uh, last longer and be more widely available. So, uh, Jeremy, do you have anything else you want to add? I think that's it. We really appreciate you uh, taking an hour out of your day to spend with us. And um, like Pam said, if there's anything you'd like to share or questions that you have, we're more than receptive to, to answering those. And I do want to say that it is the fourth year mark, and we appreciate your taking the time today. And if you were somebody who was personally impacted, um, we hope that you find sort of some, some solidarity and some some love uh, in these exhibits and from, from all of the different events that are going on. Uh, if you're not aware, the Pulse Remembrance Ceremony uh, is going to be happening um, virtually this evening. So um, you can tune into that. Um, but we're always open for questions and we continue to always center our community, uh, the 49, their families, survivors, first responders. Um, you know, we continue to center them uh, in our efforts to make sure that uh, there's the proper memorial and the, the proper uh, historical uh, collection for this event. So thank you all. Uh, have a, a good Friday. Um, and um, we'll hope to see you again. Thank you, guys.